emergency and crisis management uh, readiness at all times. Um, within the risk landscape, I'm going to share with you our views here from Willis Towers Watson on some general and specific uh, potential risk factors that you need to consider. And then we are going to uh, emphasize the problem in today's society of active shooter. Uh, let's keep in mind, again, it's extremely unlikely likely that um, of gun violence could impact uh, any of your camps. Uh, however, the potential of that, uh, though very slight, has an extremely negative impact uh, were it to happen, and therefore it's important to be fully prepared and ready to identify, deter, and respond to such an event. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm going to share with you important red flags. These are behavioral indicators of workplace violence, uh, which could occur in any venue, as we've seen, from movie theaters to uh, public uh, gatherings to schools and, and others, God forbid. So uh, on that, uh, we will have two brief mini case studies to uh, demonstrate the importance of red flags. Then, uh, subsequent to that, I'm going to dive into what we like to call your personal security toolkit, and this will give you uh, tips and tactics for responding to security threats at camp and security incidents so that they do not escalate. Uh, and then also we're going to cover the uh, run-hide fight methodology for how to respond to, uh, again, the extremely unlikely but um, critical event of a gun violence uh, incident. Um, and then uh, we will wrap up uh, with um, a special slide we've prepared for you. Uh, demonstrating uh, various considerations which we feel uh, you should use almost in a checklist fashion as you again prepare for, for summer camp. Okay, super. So uh, moving right along to the uh, next slide, which is slide number three, uh, I'd like to suggest to you, and I would submit to you each, that this is um, how we view the camp environment security cycle. It's fluid. It should be uh, uh, something that uh, gives you um, a way to visualize the importance of maintaining good security at camp. And so let's start in the uh, blue module, if you would. And we like to, uh, again, suggest that a, a threat uh, is determined by the risk times the vulnerability times the consequence. So what we mean here is that the risk of um, various security categories, which we'll cover in our presentation, uh, you know, what's the likelihood uh, that they could then occur, what's your vulnerability uh, in and around those, uh, and the uh, uh, potential consequence should such an event take place. Now, obviously, with uh, active shooter scenario, uh, the uh, consequence I've said is extremely high and, and unacceptable, you know, with, this, with the security event of an unauthorized person entering camp uh, after hours, uh, you know, uh, more likely uh, local teenagers coming on site to attempt to, to meet the other kids, whatever it may be, uh, that would be of a concern, uh, but certainly can be uh, mitigated uh, by good proper perimeter security and staff awareness. So a couple of examples there. Your goal at the end of the day, so when you go to sleep each night or, or throughout the year, you have confidence that you have property protection, and most importantly, we're protecting our crown jewels of uh, campers, uh, guests, families, and obviously ourselves and our staff as well. The green module of situational awareness and security consciousness is reflected in today that we're having a briefing that we're that each of you is focused on good security for the summer camps and that you're aware of any security uh, considerations all right so next slide this is what we suggest as the risk landscape on slide number four so clearly these are generalized there's criminal risks anywhere in society today uh, those could be uh, internal or externally driven. Uh, by that, we mean uh, a perpetrator from off-site uh, would be an external 
offender of some sort. Internal could be that uh, someone slips through a background check and presents a uh, security uh, risk somehow uh, to campers, whether of a um, uh, predatory nature uh, or, or looking to steal uh, from the, the, the site, any number of uh, random uh, or planned uh, criminal endeavors, obviously. Uh, now, the um, other risk factors here that are generalized would be uh, severe weather, which I'm sure you plan for uh, in your emergency plans, as long, along with uh, natural disasters and the like. Then terrorism, extremely unlikely uh, in any environment, but something to uh, nonetheless be prepared for uh, in today's um, uh, risk environment. Uh, thinking back certainly to the horrific uh, domestic terror uh, events uh, that we've encountered, none having certainly directly targeted a, a camp. Uh, we'd have to go to Norway, in my knowledge, to to recall that horrific incident of 2011. Uh, however, uh, with these um, uh, uh, extremist and other uh, driven terrorist threats, we need to be sure that we're uh, prepared in our risk landscape considerations. Um, and then specifically what we're spending some time on today would be active assailants and the uh, potential for violence at work, or in this case, in the camp environment. Uh, our next slide uh, continues with this, and this is our best thinking, along with feedback from the insurance board, uh, on some uh, primary topics of concern specifically for each of you, perhaps, and uh, I'll allow you to, to look at these here, please. Um, I found what I thought was an interesting quote from a, a gentleman there on the right side of the slide you'll see in, in which he was pointing out that uh, while schools, uh, public, private, charter, and otherwise, have really begun to emphasize uh, uh, school protection vis-a-vis uh, -vis the horrific mass shootings and other uh, incidents that we've had, uh, you know, he's making the point there that perhaps camps haven't done as much. And, and part of that, of course, would be because they haven't, thank goodness, been directly targeted and things of that nature to certainly the extent of schools. But he's pointing out that um, uh, they could be seen as a softer or a more vulnerable target environment for the bad guys. And so I thought that was uh, noteworthy. Now, um, one of our themes here in our security practice is that your security risk is absolutely manageable. There's nothing especially aggravated that's brought us to do this briefing today. Uh, we know that you can have a safe and wonderful camping experiences. I've uh, experienced that with my children over the years and, and have a daughter who's working her third summer at a Boy Scout camp as a as a director now uh, here in the Pocono Mountains near us, and just really thinks it's fantastic uh, 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 services and and growth that you offer the kids. But it is important, of course, to look across each of these and be sure that we're embedding a sense of security uh, awareness and consciousness within your operations. Security should be part of the camp DNA, we would advocate. And um, you see the, the list here of, of potential considerations that we, would, uh, that we had highlighted for you here. Um, on each of these briefly, uh, certainly a good baseline for avoiding any violence at, at work or in the camp environment is to have a zero tolerance policy and to make that clear to everyone involved. Uh, harassment, hazing, uh, gender, uh, bullying or teasing, none of this is acceptable, just like it isn't in, in the best schools and simply cannot be uh, tolerated on behalf of, on the part of campers or anyone associated with, uh, with your good uh, church-based activities. Um, it's important, obviously, uh, and I know background checks can assist us with this and good prudent thinking, but uh, uh, predators, sexual predators who are looking to offend and perhaps to gain the trust of uh, young campers, uh, they're very conniving. 
uh, psychologically and uh, certainly can can uh, fool individuals uh, into getting where they want uh, to be into that uh, uh, target's um, uh, sense of confidence and within their inner circle. And so it's important to be on the lookout for any uh, suspicious or inappropriate behavior and to act on it quickly. Um, I mentioned the camper drop-off and pick-up protocols here uh, because, to me, that's an important time to ensure good physical security of all. So head counts, uh, containing the area, ensuring that you're getting uh, proper uh, pickups by the right individuals, and not just letting the departure, for example, um, sort of blend into um, uh, a mass of people, which I've, I've seen elsewhere, which can be concerning. Let's keep that good security mentality right up until everyone is safely on their way home. Um, on emergency preparedness and response, you likely have fire code and other reasons that you have fire evacuation plans in places where there could be an external threat like a hazardous material leak or a tornado as we just experienced uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina yesterday, um, you can see that shelter in place is important and you likely have addressed these. But have you addressed uh, an intruder, hostile intruder, or an active shooter response plan uh, within your methodology? Maybe not. Need to do so, we would, we would suggest. Next slide, number, uh, number six. So I provide to you here our quantification once again. And also um, uh, a definition of uh, active shooter. I then uh, provide for you here an interesting quote from a magazine regarding the causations of these attacks. Uh, what is driving? What is incenting uh, these perpetrators? And of course, as we know from these horrific incidents referenced here, by the way, the last one in Colorado references an attack on Planned Parenthood some time ago. Um, but uh, the causations are all over the map, and the best thing that we can do is to have good security consciousness and awareness so as to identify and disrupt any potential hostile intruder or attack that's coming forward, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about doing in just a moment. So um, I'm going to move to slide number seven. Now... Uh, I, I want you to pay careful attention to this, please, because this is extremely important and often overlooked. Domestic abuse is a workplace violence, or in your case, a summer camp uh, facility-oriented uh, uh, risk. Domestic abuse is responsible for all these uh, bad statistics seen here on this slide, and frankly, is often missed by security planners because they're not thinking of where the threat may originate from. So um, in the camp environment, you may have staffers or uh, you know colleagues who possess restraining orders against uh, uh, ex-husbands, uh, boyfriends, uh, excuse me, stalkers, uh, and the like. Um, they may not tell you about it out of sense of uh, privacy, and it may not be enforceable at the camp location. Perhaps it only mentions their home address, for example, or, or their work location during the year or something. So uh, this is a concern. Uh, there are relationships that may have developed over past summers at camps uh, that have ended, and there can be hard feelings. number of concerning issues here I would suggest to you, and therefore it's important to think of this as a potential um, recipe for uh, 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 hostile intruders or violence. We need to act against that. Okay. The next slide, number eight, this reveals some noteworthy characteristics that we've seen across many uh, attacks uh, in society. Uh, what I would call to your attention here would be the uh, fact that they evolve quickly. Therefore, we really do need to be prepared and that they generally aren't over until the perpetrator either uh, commits suicide or is stopped by police. Uh, important to know, as you'll see in just a bit, uh, as we go through our run-hide-fight methodology. Um, also, I'd like to point out that uh, uh, camp, summer camp, surely can generate the normal 
emotional responses of homesickness and uh, uh, longing for acceptance uh, and, and various things like that, peer to peer. Um, it also, you know, there could be, there can be that rare instance where an individual uh, has untreated mental illness that we don't know about. Uh, maybe hasn't been diagnosed or is not correctly treated. And I would stress untreated because the mentally ill are far more likely to be victims of violent crime than to, to be violent. But this is something that in your assessments and in your close interactions with the campers uh, and your colleagues to certainly keep in mind. All right, next slide, number nine. This slide and the following two are extremely important we are revealing here uh, FBI Training Academy and security industry uh, red flags. These are proven behavioral characteristics that those who've committed acts of violence in places like schools and, and elsewhere uh, have demonstrated. Okay, and you see I referenced the horrific uh, summer camp attack in Norway some years ago. I uh, hate to even say that I believe there were maybe 70 people killed that day by this uh, uh, extremely delusional and uh, 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 individual uh, in that instance with weapons and a, a delusional uh, grandiose thoughts and whatnot. So very rare, uh, particularly there, um, and yet a troubling, troubling event. Uh, he would have displayed numerous of these red flags. So we're not trying to be psychiatrists here. We're not trying to uh, have 2020 hindsight looking back at past tragedies. What we're trying to do is to share with you some behavioral red flags that have been seen recurrently, uh, recurringly in uh, acts of violence in society. Now, any of us can exhibit certain uh, changes in behavior, and some of these that you see on these three slides over a period of time, that does not mean we're going to be violent. But when you start to see numerous of these perhaps being shown, or an especially aggravated one, particularly when there are marked changes in behavior that you're noticing, this could be a, a signal that the person needs help. And so they may need um, uh, uh, referral to medical uh, professionals. And that might be just enough to, to uh, have prevented an act of, uh, of violence. We'll never know often, uh, but we also won't experience the event. Okay? And so the third slide here uh, references the additional um, uh, red flags that we feel are important. So again, you'll notice about there's reference to weapons and threats. Uh, just being on top of these in your written uh, policies and procedures and your communications to parents and campers can help to uh, negate so many of these risks. All right, so moving right along, I'm going to reveal uh, two brief case studies to you here to demonstrate, again, the effectiveness of red flag uh, assessment. Uh, now, this first case study is much more subtle uh, than the second one and will challenge you a bit more. Um, neither of these took place at camps. Uh, however, we can learn from them. Uh, they took place in, in places of employment. In this first case study, the individual was an internal threat. He was an employee there. And in the second case, it, he's the uh, husband of an employee. He goes to the work and commits an act of workplace violence. So what I'd like you to learn from these is uh, to look briefly through these red flags that are revealed here, or sorry, these case facts that were determined after the incident. So after Mr. Hendren committed an act of workplace violence, they went back and as part of the investigation, these case facts were determined. So what do we have here? Um, he was involved in the class action lawsuit. Probably not a problem. Not a red flag in my view necessarily at all. Uh, feeling ostracized, feeling left out at work. That could be a bit of an issue after 30 years. Uh, look at this. He'd been sociable and joking, but he turned sullen. Hated his boss. He was back to ordinary labor after three decades, uh, increasingly unhappy, disgruntled and agitated, prone to outbursts of anger. Wait a minute, I thought he was sociable and joking. So see, we have some issues here. Again, this one's more subtle, but at the end of the day, we find that he committed a, a major act of workplace violence. Could that have been picked up on, and had he been referred to 
employee assistance program long before or a law enforcement investigation or what have you. Who knows? Uh, that's, that was a tough one. But certainly, uh, we see the tragic result. In our second mini case study, again, a far more overt case, uh, this individual, Mr. Stewart, uh, his wife is an employee of a uh, continuing care retirement center, and she describes him at work as abusive, a history of work of uh, domestic violence, uh, alcohol abuser, uh, possession of weapons, a number of things that, uh, when you combine those, are quite troubling. And she then tells her work that he threatened her recently with a gun. Uh, she then informs her work that uh, she thought an attack on herself at her workplace was imminent, going to happen, perhaps at work, and uh, that he's exhibiting mental, uh, m- uh, mental unbalance. Okay, so th- this, is, this is very concerning. Were you to get any of these sort of reports at camp, uh, immediate law enforcement notification and uh, steps would need to be taken in, in prompt consultations within your organization. And here's what he did. He came back and, and committed, he came to her work rather, and committed an act of, of violence there. Um, uh, Wanda, his, uh, his uh, spouse, had done everything right. Picture her as a camp staffer or a parent of a camper who is sharing with you, uh, you know, discreetly some developments. Uh, and she did everything right. She told all the things. She basically uh, put the organization, her employer, into a state of a duty to care, duty to warn. And I don't know all the steps that they did or didn't take and themselves in local law enforcement, but irregardless, they, they were not effective, were they? Okay, going to uh, slide 16, where we have our image of the uh, run, hide, fight, uh, shooter. Now, uh, again, extremely unlikely that, that any camp would, would suffer a horrific attack like this, but we certainly see it in the schools, uh, most recently, of course, being Parkland. Uh, in that instance, we had a uh, mentally ill with uh, incomplete treatment uh, uh, young man with access to shoulder weapons, Lots of red flags were seen if you study that case, and uh, we know the the, the sad, uh, very sad outcomes, okay? So what I'd like you to do here now is to uh, think of, of yourself as being in an environment, God forbid, but we're talking about camps, so let's go there in our mind, and you hear the sound of gunfire, okay? And in that, uh, you need to uh, act quickly because the shooters are aware in all these instances that as soon as they begin firing, a police response is soon coming. Uh, they know that. And therefore, if you can implement the uh, run-hide-fight methodology, you can help to save your life and others. Uh, now, I understand, I understand that they gave this a lot of thought, that in the camp environment, uh, lockdown procedures may be your preferred uh, of course, like in many schools, particularly elementary and middle schools. Um, however, uh, the uh, various what-if scenarios were too broad for me to cover that here in a, in a brief webinar, and therefore I chose to stick to the government-endorsed run-hide-fight methodology that's been seen to be effective. If you go back to YouTube, where there was an attack at their headquarters by a, a shooter just two weeks ago, uh, many employees evacuated immediately upon learning of the uh, of the hostile event that was underway, and by getting out of the building, uh, thus got to safety. So I just use that to quickly demonstrate. So let's move ahead to the first of my run, hide, fight three slides, which is slide number 17. Now, um, here, I've written it out for you, as I said, uh, you know, uh, pretend that you overhear or that you hear rather the sound of gunfire. And uh, I've made some notations here for you to look at uh, later. I'm sure that uh, Monica will be sharing the deck. Um, and then a description of what run looks like. So this is the preferred step in any event is to evacuate and get out and away. Now, I, again, I realize there's some unique applications in the camp environment. You can have open fields. You can have 
you know, large open buildings like the, the, the mess hall, if you will, and so on. And I also recognize that if you really want to get, uh, you know, into various uh, considerations, that having everyone uh, exit a building, of course, you could be walking into a planned secondary attack or additional threats. Uh, frankly, we're not talking about, uh, you know, the provisional IRA attacks from years ago or sophisticated ISIS attacks. We're talking about a different phenomena for the most part. And so it's still our belief, and obviously DHS's, that exiting and getting away is, is your best first response. Okay? So here's the run steps for you to uh, review at your convenience. Um, the next slide addresses hide. Now, if you're unable to get away, or if doing so would be unsafe, say you're, you're in the camp director's office, and to step out and head for the nearest exit would put you in the line of, of fire, or you've got a number of campers with you and you don't feel it's the best move to make, then sheltering in place, in this case hiding, uh, can be a very effective uh, simply covering and concealing yourself uh, with tables, with uh, uh, anything available, uh, you know, uh, getting into storerooms, thing like that, things like that. And I say that partly because of earlier what I pointed out, that it's unlikely that the shooter or shooters are going to spend time trying to break into individual rooms. For the most part, they know they have a short period of time to carry out their, uh, their violence. So that's the hide uh, portion. This can be tricky uh, in any environment these days. There are fewer opaque doors, there's fewer conference rooms with locks, things like that. Um, but certainly you can create a plan, as we recommend at the end of today's briefing, uh, that's site-specific to your church camp environment. Um, next, the fight portion. Now, coming from Virginia Tech in 2007, uh, it was seen that resisting the attacker as a last resort um, is, uh, can be quite effective. And we've seen that many times since where heroes have, such at Parkland, uh, uh, have, uh, uh, given their lives or been able to, um, distract a shooter while police responded. In fact, after Parkland, there was a shooting event in a Maryland high school shortly thereafter in which the school resource officer was able to, uh, terminate the attack. Uh, and a number of people there had acted out aggressively against the uh, the shooter, as I understand it. So certainly this can can be effective uh, and is important. I would stress here, though, that uh, giving making nine one one calls as soon as possible and sharing the details of uh, attacker, weapon involved, location, uh, things of this nature, is really really key. All right. So I'm just doing a time check. We're doing well. We're a little over halfway through our presentation. Certainly appreciate your uh, attention. Um, here, uh, I wanted to share with you the expected law enforcement response at camp. Now, I, I urge you later uh, in the presentation to always carry out law enforcement liaison year-round. Get to know your local authorities. Invite them to come by for a courtesy meal, uh, you know, offer coffee. Invite them to walk through camp uh, to be familiar with the uh, grounds and the layout, these sort of things. Really, really important uh, liaison and urge you to, to do that. I'm sure you do, both with uh, police, fire, sheriff's office, whatever you have available to you, uh, EMT group. Uh, here, what we're talking about is what to anticipate during that highly unlikely uh, weapons attack, a gun violence attack at camp. So up until Parkland High School, uh, ever since, again, Virginia Tech, there'd been a, a real uh, excellent record of law enforcement uh, responding and immediately engaging the perpetrators. This was a uh, conscious strategy that was employed uh, courtesy of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, after Virginia Tech, when we realized that coming, setting up a perimeter and waiting for the SWAT team would no longer do. Why is that? Everyone recalls these incidents progress quickly. They're a bit random and they evolve quickly, as I say, and you don't have time uh, to do that. 
So if you think back to the terrible San Bernardino attack last year with the, the couple of uh, extremist perpetrators, um, the first response, uh, police response uh, persons, I think there was a campus police officer from nearby. There was a detective in a blazer who had been having lunch. It was kind of a mishmash, but they were able to engage quickly. And that's what you want to expect in any camp environment. And I think discussing that uh, as part of your police liaison is really important. Okay, next slide, slide number 21. This is something from where the insurance board sits. And myself and my colleagues on the line from Willis Towers Watson, uh, and also uh, those of you as uh, camp directors and, and other leaders, you need to be sure that you have a post-violence plan. Again, this is not going to happen to you. I feel very confident in almost every possible instance, thank goodness. However, just like you would have a plan for dealing with um, a uh, uh, accident, a medical emergency, and other uh, key developments at camp, you should have uh, uh, some bullets within your plan for how to deal with the aftermath of a, um, a violent attack of some sort or unauthorized intruder and other things. And then in this instance, you can see some important points. First of all, God forbid you had an incident like this at camp, you're going to have press attention. You're going to have uh, you're going to be swamped with phone calls from concerned uh, parents and others. And so knowing what to quickly uh, proactively react to and having some plans in place is really important. Uh, maybe the camp becomes a crime scene and you're not able to carry on operations. So obviously you dismiss that group for the summer, I would imagine. But what about uh, uh, the next wave of campers? Or what about where the staff needs to go to complete their work? Do you have alternate work sites? Do people have laptops they could uh, work from remotely? Things of that nature are from the business continuity side as well. Okay, very important. Moving right along. Um, this uh, issue of liability is a critical one. It's not your major concern. Uh, obviously, that's protection of your crown jewels, which are your campers, staffers, uh, family, and guests. However, um, it's important to everyone that we diminish uh, uh, risk and liability, potential liability. And um, what I would share with you here is another a verbal case study. Uh, at Kraft Foods in Philadelphia in 2010, a longtime uh, female employee uh, there who was known and documented in her personnel file to be belligerent, could become confrontational and so on at work. Uh, she was called to a meeting with human resources and others and told that she'd be put on uh, administrative leave while they resolved her latest um, misconduct at work. She was escorted to her car by a contract security officer. However, he did not watch her leave. He simply walked her out. He went back in the building. She retrieved a handgun from her glove box came back inside the building, which in your case could be someone returning back to the camp who's disgruntled, um, who is, uh, has a grievance, who is, has untreated mental illness, uh, who is uh, irate. And in that case, she uh, killed several people. The victims' uh, awards, jury awards, against both Kraft and the large uh, major guard company uh, were in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, clearly, something like that would, would be the end of uh, camp operations in many instances, uh, permanently, I would sadly think. Uh, and it's just so important to uh, be aware of our uh, obligations and our duty to care and duty to warn. Um, I'm not quite sure, frankly, if the general duty clause under OSHA um, would apply in every instance. I'm, I'm not an attorney. But I felt important to share this here to give you some framework uh, as employers of, uh, uh, of, of staff in the summer and the need to protect and to provide uh, training like today, as well as reasonable safeguards uh, for both internal and, as you'll notice here at the bottom, external threats of violence. Okay, now, this is what I'd like to suggest that you frame your entire thinking around summer camp security uh, in, in this model here, please. This is a matrix that we like to, to utilize 
And what we're, the point we're making here is, for throughout your, your summer activities and your work delivering uh, these great experiences for the kids, uh, you can't have anyone, and you can't go through life, frankly, either. This is applicable to your private life as well. You cannot go around in a tuned-out uh, manner here at the bottom. That leaves one open to criminal victimization. An example of that would be all the people across the country every day who are robbed of their uh, uh, iPhones and, and other devices by walking down the street with their face buried in the phone, completely unaware of, of their environment, and someone simply runs by and snatches it, for example. Or, you know, you could, you could uh, walk into the wrong area, you could step off a curb wrong, whatever it may be. Simply not a good, prudent practice. Where we want you to be is in the next um, color-coded uh, phase of relaxed awareness. Every employee at camp needs to remain like that throughout the day. Should they witness something concerning or troubling from a safety, a security, or otherwise uh, perspective, they can migrate up temporarily into focused awareness. An example I would give of that in the camp environment would be um, that uh, it's noted that um, uh, that two campers are, are arguing. It appears to be uh, teenagers. It appears to be uh, uh, nothing that won't quickly uh, dissipate, but but then it escalates unexpectedly. And obviously, those uh, uh, staffers who are who are uh, nearby this or who learn of it and witness it, they're going to migrate up into focused awareness to quickly go and deal with the issue. Once it's over. You can migrate, escalate, or sorry, you can de-escalate back down into a state of relaxed awareness. I was at the movie theater a few weeks ago. There was a, a film uh, my wife didn't care to see, and I went to enjoy it by myself one Friday evening. And while there, I, absolutely, I was in relaxed awareness, really having a nice time, enjoying my soda and the show. And about halfway through the movie, I noticed a young man walk in. Uh, it was a cold winter night, so maybe it was few more weeks back but anyway um and walked in late in the movie there was very few people in the show and um uh he was wearing a large backpack seemed quite heavy and appropriate winter clothing but nonetheless so it didn't didn't worry me but i've been doing this sort of work long enough this sort of mindset uh that uh i paid a little bit of attention to him saw where he sat saw where the nearest exit was uh you know, uh, determined there was no threat of any sort and continued enjoying my show. All that probably in about 20 seconds. Um, there have been, obviously, many shootings in cinemas and some of our other nearby theaters here in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania even have off-duty police on uh, weekend nights, I've noted. This one does not. So that's an example of where I migrated into focused awareness and then right back down. Now, had... In either of those examples I use, the, the uh, fight at camp or the suspicious person at movies, had either, in the extremely unlikely event, developed into something worse, then you take yourself up into high alert temporarily while you deal with the situation. All right? You don't want to freeze, and we're going to reveal that here, uh, the notion of um, fight, flight, or, or freeze. You don't want to freeze and go into a comatose environment in your mindset, you want to train yourself to respond appropriately. Um, I'd like, I like this theme for you so much in the camp environment that I've also portrayed it here in a slightly different graph. Again, this, in this case, it's moving from left to right rather than uh, up and down. Uh, and uh, you'd want to be in the rack, relaxed but alert phase. And look at these added values from having this security mentality at camp and fostering it across your workplace. Uh, we believe that it will promote the confidence of all involved. It helps to support diversity and inclusion, which combats the uh, bullying uh, and intimidation that I know you're concerned about. And a very, very important theme shows that good security at camp is everyone's responsibility. It's not just the, the church camp director or his assistants, his or her assistants. It's not just the, um, the, any security guard program you may or may not have. It's not just the local police. It's everyone's responsibility to be on the alert and report suspicious people, vehicles, 
incidents or actions. All right. So in order to stay safe, we recommend uh, ensuring that you provide uh, this through your communications and other ways that you can uh, exhibit good security consciousness. Now, I'm going to pause just a moment here while my any meeting comes right back up. There we go. Uh, now, on that, I promised you fight, flight, or freeze. So for many years, fight or flight was known to all of us. I think we learned in school about uh, non-human primates and, and humans all exhibiting a fight or flight uh, tendency or, or trait when confronted with um, threats, which I think that they... I think school taught us that it went all the way back to, um, uh, you know, sort of the uh, predatory animal uh, avoidance many, many, many eons ago. But frankly, it's appropriate, too, in, in the camp environment to any high-stress security uh, event. Let me tell you this, and I, I could not be more uh, serious about this. Any act of crime, from stealing your iPhone on the street up to a targeted and planned attack on a camp uh, is going to be preceded by a period of hostile surveillance by the bad guys and or gals. And what I mean by that is no one just commits an act. The, 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 the hostile surveillance on the street to rob your purse, your iPhone, to, to mug you and demand your wallet, that surveillance might only last 20 seconds where the individual picks someone out as a softer target or realizes that they're totally unalert to their surroundings uh, or, you know, the wallet's hanging out of the pocket, you can see the cash, those kind of things. And in a more sophisticated event, like wanting to come on a camp after hours to uh, conduct a, an abduction, God forbid, or a physical attack or a planned theft or a sexual assault or an act of violence, all these things uh, don't just happen out of the blue. And so if we are alert at the perimeter to suspicious people, as I said before, vehicles, events, we can identify concerning uh, developments and disrupt any potential event. It can be very effective. Um, and this uh, would happen through uh, the good security cognizance, the situ situational awareness I've been speaking of, as well as your ability to call that local uh, lieutenant or the desk sergeant after hours, even if it's not 911, and say, uh, you know, hey, Detective Jones, uh, we've noticed the same uh, blue van go by three times a day and look suspicious. Um, we call it part of the plate. Could you have a patrol officer be, you know, check that out for us or come sit out front for a few hours? We'd sure feel more secure. Okay, quick example. Those things are really good security practices. Now, here, as promised, is where I dive a bit deeper into our best thinking around some key action steps for camps. I'm sure that each of you is more expert in many or all of these than, than I am uh, because of the work you've done in the camp environment, but a good bit of thinking and research and feedback from the insurance board uh, caused me to capture these. Obviously, I'm trying to stay to one slide that's legible. There are more, but th this is what I felt was uh, noteworthy. So I would urge you to uh, review and consider these, maybe discuss them in your work teams, um, something, you know, as you uh, plan for the summer, um, and any others that, that you are aware of. Um, I think that, that each of these could add value um, in your security posture for the camps. Um, several we've talked about already. Um, I would uh, simply call attention to a couple things here. Um, think, if you go back in your mind to our uh, third slide today, which was the color-coded sort of security cycle, remember that, the blue, purple, and green? One key piece of that was uh, situational awareness, and then also we talked about um, any uh, risk and vulnerability. So look at this last bullet here, threat assessment. I would urge you, if you spend no more than 15 minutes as a work team, church uh, camp director and his, his or her key uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, colleagues, think about that and say to yourself, is there any special threat or risk posture that we have for this camp session for this summer? 
and think that through, looking at some of the things we've talked about today. Uh, maybe, for example, as I've noted here, um, and I realize that you, you primarily operate with uh, uh, good folks from uh, the uh, Presbyterian, uh, a Baptist, and, and other church groups, but perhaps you've got a, um, uh, some visitors, uh, like my daughter's uh, Boy Scout camp did last summer. They had a week of um, uh, Muslim Boy Scouts. Some were even from the Middle East came with their with their den leaders and whatnot. Uh, maybe you've got uh, some kind of a faith based exchange with a, uh, a Jewish group. Those can bring heightened security attention. Obviously, uh, perhaps um, you've got a high net worth or a well known influential uh, family represented in a particular session. Uh, that might bring added security or press attention somehow. And then obviously much more likely than either of those, um, maybe there are some uh, confrontational custody issues with children that are underway and other things. Keep it in mind that, that almost all abductions and kidnappings of children are related to, um, to that process, not, thank goodness, by strangers. So an important point. Um, also, I, I know that you emphasize these things um, but, uh, you know, to avoidance of sexual abuse and, and quickly acting on anything that appears to be uh, inappropriate, better to vet that out and embarrass uh, someone and have to apologize perhaps or something uh, than to uh, perhaps miss um, a predatory uh, um, overture by, by an adult, okay? Um, and so uh, these, again, were, are, are some factors that we thought might be of interest uh, to you. Um, in uh, closing, right on time with our plans here, um, I wanted to share with you uh, the Willis Towers Watson security practice recommended solutions and some ways to, to make use of today's learnings. Um, and so uh, in order to keep your camp safe uh, from these problems, and so I've listed these uh, here, many of which we've talked about. You'll recall the phrase of embedding security in your camp's DNA. I think um, outside of obviously of target practice and, and legitimate things like that, you want to consider prohibiting firearms. Um, I, you know, uh, cert certainly there's some argument to be made for a trained concealed weapons carrying employee can, can help protect the camp. I understand all that. I'm just giving you our primary starting point for consideration. And uh, something I did forget to mention today under the emergency preparedness, along with having the active shooter plan of run, hide, fight, is very important to have a telephonic uh, bomb threat plan in case uh, a kid or anyone else uh, maybe more seriously looks to disrupt camp by making a, a bomb threat over the phone or through uh, uh, email or what have you. And uh, that's something that I would recommend you address. So um, I hope this has been uh, noteworthy. Appreciate everyone's time and attention. And we remain available um, uh, by way of the insurance board should there be any uh, 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 questions or remarks or uh, just as a courtesy wishing, wishing to follow up. And I'll turn it back over to... Uh, Monica. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for all the great information and a lot of points to consider. If anyone has any questions, please type them either in the chat or the question box, and we will get to them. And just quickly wanted to let you know regarding today's webinar, it, will, it has been recorded and will be available on our website at www.insuranceboard.org under Safety Resources, and we will also have the slides available. And let me come over here. It looks like we did have a question. How often should a camp address their active shooter action plan? How often to train or run drills with staff? And how do you address training with guests at a camp? Excellent uh, points. Well, uh, I was very impressed. Monica shared with me in our uh, consultations prior to the call today the webinar today, uh, that uh, many of you have gone through um, active shooter response training. Uh, we actually have partnered in the past with the vendor provider who, is, who has done that for you, uh, and so we're very familiar with um, 
what they teach, and, and it, it tracks, as you all now know, <laughs> extremely well with our run, hide, fight learnings today. Um, so, um, first of all, uh, well done. If you have a plan already, uh, which the questions seem to indicate, then you're way ahead of the game, uh, and you're doing just great, particularly with the extreme unlikelihood that something like that would happen. Um, if you've trained, if you've uh, put a plan in place, I would not set uh, any specific time frames for updating it. Instead, I would just look to keep it fresh and current. Um, therefore, when when staff names changed or when facilities were renovated or different buildings added or you know exited things like that, that you use that as opportunities to update the plan. I would certainly ensure that it was um, refreshed and reviewed prior to each uh, summer camp uh, going getting underway again in the summertime. So I think all that would be would be fair and would be reasonable. Um, if uh, there are learnings from other attacks, God forbid, in in society, that's another good time to bring the team together. You remember I talked about a threat assessment team. Maybe the church director, camp directors decide, I'm going to have one of those informal working groups. Uh, we could meet virtually during the year whenever, uh, w- whenever events dictate, and at that time we could review our plan as well. Monica, are you there? Well, I'm sorry, everyone. I had my mute button on. didn't realize it. I apologize. Um, I did have someone asking for the website where the slideshow would be at. And if you go to our website at www.insuranceboard.org and then click on the link for safety resources, and at the bottom of that drop-down menu, Insurance Board Services, it will list... um, the prior webinars, and and this will be listed on there shortly today, and you will be able to access the slides there. And also, I had another question, who do we ask for regarding active shooter training? And again, if you go to the website, uh, there is a a link down there, contact us if you just click on that, and then um, we'll be able to get the right person reaching out to you. Okay? Great. One more question. Is there a template or resource to create an EOP for a camp or conference center? I know FEMA has one for houses of worship. Um, I didn't see it. I'm only hearing you. Uh, EOP, are we talking about emergency operations plans, you think, Monica? Yes. Yeah, oh, oh yes. Uh, Jennifer Jennifer says yes. Um and then, oh, there's something else from uh, Reverend Davison. Anyway, um, uh, Jennifer, uh, yes, FEMA, I believe, has that, that template available. Uh, if you don't find it, uh, please contact Monica offline, and I'd be happy to uh, get back to her and help provide it for the, for the team. Great. And then Reverend Michael Davison asked, our region rents facilities for our summer camps? Do you suggest requesting a security plan from the site as part of the summer preparation? Oh, that's a great idea, Reverend. Uh, uh, yes, uh, because that that that's excellent. That will not only uh, demonstrate to the uh, renter or the provider of your space, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, your security consciousness and your expectations uh, for for them addressing this. And that's a really good point because the whole uh, landlord tenant, uh, and this is the same in commercial space as, as it would be for camps. Uh, a lot of that is dependent upon the the landlord or the owner, isn't it? Uh, the property management firm. And so, uh, not only what I requested of them, excellent, yes, but uh, you know, upon getting it, uh, you may want to sit with your with your team and determine any uh, gap analysis or exposures there that you see. And, uh, and and request that they remediate those as part of the contract going forward. I hope that helped answer that question. Do we have any other questions? We've got about one minute left. Unless somebody's a really fast typer, I think that's maybe going to be about <laughs> it. 
So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you especially to Nick. I really appreciate you coming on and helping helping us out with this topic. And, again, if anyone has any questions, um, you can email me or uh, my, my email address is M as in Mary Kornblum, K-O-R-N-B as in boy, L-U-M as in Mary, at insuranceboard.org. Or you can go to our website, click on the Contact Us button, and uh, we will definitely respond to you and get you pointed to the right person. So thank you again, and I appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you, Monica, and the insurance board, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being on the call. Have a safe summer, and please advise Monica if uh, those of us here at Willis Talis Watson can help anytime.